I see. Welcome, everybody. And uh, 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 it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Shivaji Sundi, who is a Deccan Professor of Physics at Oxford. Uh, so Shivaji is a, uh, is a condensed matter physicist, He's worked extensively on various aspects, including topological phases. Um, he, uh, he, 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 you know, he's done various uh, important things like uh, discovering skirmions in the quantum Hall effect and uh, uh, the prediction of magnetic monopoles in spin ice, for which he won the EPS Europhysics Prize. And so today he'll talk about um, uh, um, this open-ended topic towards an interactive quantum dynamics. So Shivaji. Uh, uh, Great. So, so thank you, Amesh, for this uh, uh, kind invitation. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is to sort of, um, um, you know, pitch a certain vision, which is uh, certainly uh, not unique to me, but really involves various people uh, on this in the seminar, as well as uh, the others, and more broadly, I would say it's shared by, I guess, a lot of people working in the field, uh, and Umesh himself. Uh, I will give you sort of my version of it, um, which is the, the viewpoint of a, a sort of many body physicist. This is uh, primarily a, a seminar, I guess, in quantum computing. And um, so I'm going to come at it from a somewhat different angle, which hopefully will be useful when I'll build the story around a recent uh, experiment I've done uh, at Google um, and uh, tell you a little bit about it, but it will not primarily be an experimental talk with Pedram Roshan, who did, the, you know, the ex chief experimentalist uh, will be on, on the panel. And if uh, the questions are of interest, it's without the details, I'm sure he would be delighted to, to address them. So I, I'm going to try and sort of, uh, at Omesha's explicit invitation, try and lay out a, a somewhat broad vision. So I guess at the risk of being, oops, that was not right. So let's get it um, At the risk of being, uh, you know, uh, overly uh, pedagogical, let me just uh, remind all of us that, you know, sort of quantum mechanics is sort of fundamentally a theory of, A theory of unitary evolutions plus sort of non unitary measurements. When I say fundamentally, I mean that in practice, that's how it works. Uh, if you're a quantum cosmologist, um, you know, maybe it's fundamentally a theory of unitary evolutions alone, and then the problem switches to how you recover the world that you live in uh, from a unitary system of some description, perhaps close, perhaps not. But in terms of sort of everyday physics, um, I think it's fair to say that it's a theory of unitary evolutions and non-unitary measurements. Um, and I'm saying this instead of, you know, sort of Hamiltonians, because any experiment uh, that you do, any phenomenon that you observe, uh, you know, has a start and a finish. And so you really begin with getting from here to there in time and then from there, you, you work backwards to objects like Hamilton. Now, nicely enough, uh, a quantum computer um, is also a device uh, which is sort of made up of, you know, with the same ingredients. Um, And it's not, of course, it must have the same ingredients, but the nice thing is that the ingredients come in the form of a toolkit, um, which you know we're all familiar with in some sort of circuit model. I've got some set of qubits, which I can initialize. And then I've got various gates you know, that I can do a various range. And then eventually, or even before, I can do various measurements. And then maybe there's a final set of measurements where I read things out. So, so what's nice is that the, the, these devices, uh, the ones which are currently exist and also the ones that will eventually exist, um, 
very nicely directly you know um, put together these these ingredients in, in the form of modules and of course our unitary is you know is going to be constructed from some fundamental set of gates uh, which is chosen in order to be able to do all of that now um, the other thing which is uh, okay so so if I just looked at this you know I might say well um, as a physicist, um, you know, I have some unitary evolution between an initial state and a final state. And what's nice is that I can simulate that evolution um, on this device, provided I can represent the initial state to some accuracy on the initial set of qubits. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can you know, simulate the standard model if I had a large enough device. And, um, and then using the gate set, I can, I can construct any unitary. So certainly I can mimic the quantum evolution that I think is going on somewhere else on this device, which is, of course, the promise of, of quantum simulation. Now, what's interesting in some ways uh, is that one can do something else. You can measure things in between. And um, you can then feed those measurements into a classical computer and uh, feed them back into uh, this quantum device in terms of what the unitary evolution is going to be when you look further down. Now, this is not the way one normally thinks in physics of you know, experimental systems. Uh, it's true that you have an experimenter who does measurements uh, and, you know, but the idea that you should be doing these sorts of, that you should be in this intimate a dialogue with the um, you know, time evolution of a quantum system where as you go along on the scales of interest in the evolution, you know, microscopic times, that you would be able to change what happened subsequently, uh, you know, certainly strikes me as being a, a new feature. So that if we had a quantum computer sort of in dialogue with a classical computer, um, viewed simply as a physical system, if I look at it from the outside and say, you know, there are these two machines passing signals back and forth and some quantum mechanics is taking place in the quantum system. Uh, this certainly starts to look like sort of a new physical system. Uh, for practical purposes, obviously, anything that exists as a physical system as in principle is described by uh, the physics that we already understand. But in practice, in terms of, you know, uh, sort of studying it and being able to do a theory of it and the phenomena that one would expect to see in it, uh, I think this is a, a very different regime. Um, and it's this vision of having a, a physical system which has this classical computational aspect as well as quantum evolution, um, which, you know, uh, is, the interactive quantum dynamics of the title. Uh, that here is something new. And by the time we're done exploring uh, the range of things such a, a device can do, that we would have you know, found physical phenomena which are uh, very different from the ones that we are currently uh, familiar with. So again, I want to emphasize that one, you know, I'm in many body physicists. So this is, you know, from my point of view, this is a talk on many body physics, right? So, um, so what that what, what that means is the following, which is I'm going to imagine at the end of the day that I've got n qubits, uh, that this number will eventually be taken to be large, uh, and that whatever I'm doing is going to be sort of statistically homogeneous um, action on the qubits. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you think of them as sort of arranged, and of course, being physicist, you know, we typically will think of them being arranged one dimensionally or two dimensionally or three dimensionally, although sometimes also uh, in, in, in fancier ways. So that whatever is the circuit and, and set of measurements that acts on them will have the property that, you know, different parts of the system will roughly look the same statistically. Uh, so typically 
a many body physicist isn't interested in the action of a structure, you know, which is spatially very, very carefully organized. Now there are exceptions to this, you sometimes you're interested in a fractal arrangement because that's theoretically interesting, but typically that's what many body physicists like to do. The reason I bring that up is to say that a, you know, if I'm looking at qubits and the action of a circuit and measurements, of course, any quantum algorithm uh, does exactly that. But it's more than likely that from the point of view of a many body physicist, most quantum algorithms are going to be very special evolutions, maybe with you know, a particular structure on the space of qubits, which is not necessarily something that we would be interested in. We might be interested in more genetic behavior. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, uh, many body physicists looks at the object sitting in the lab and says, oh, neat, this is a new physical system. Let me run it in the way that I, you know, normally like to do things and, and see what I find. Okay. The other aspect is that a many body physicist would normally, or quantum statistical mechanic, would think of sort of, you know, you, you, you have some evolution, which is made up of these unitary and non-unitary components. And you're going to look at times which are somehow long. compared to individual gates, for example. So this comes from our interest in long wavelengths and, 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 and long times. And that's uh, very much part of the, what makes you know, many body physicists interested in the behavior of many bodies. We're interested in what happens, which is sharply new uh, in the limit of an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so, so that, I guess, so the main thing I want to say at the start is that, you know, someone like myself is interested in these devices coming into being, the MISC devices which, which exist now and the ones which come into the future from this viewpoint, which probably will not overlap with uh, those particular circuits and arrangements which are, you know, really interesting for solving particular computation problems which have been posed by something else. But hopefully they will do things which are interesting otherwise and sometimes perhaps there will be an intersection where something that looks like a new physical phenomenon will also turn out to be interesting computationally. Um, very recently the Google quantum supremacy experiment was a case where a many body physicists looked at that and said oh neat that's a minimum model for quantum you know ergodicity and that was also reinterpreted in interesting in terms that seemed interesting to uh, computer scientists. All right, good. So the next question is, um, you know, uh, what might happen in these devices, which is sort of new from the, you know, many body viewpoints. So I mean, after all, uh, if the quantum computer is simulating, you know, anything uh, whatsoever, it certainly is simulating things that we already um, study. So let me say something uh, very uh, cartoonish for a moment, which is to say, you could say that a, a huge amount of many body physics consists of starting with some, you know, set of qubits, acting on it with some circuit, which eff effectively implements, right, just unitary evolution with some specified Hamiltonian, typically with some nice properties in space where the qubits are arranged in space. And then you get to some final state. And all of this is to say that you get a final state which is obtained from some initial state by the action of a unitary which is generated by a Hamilton. Now, um, the sort of thing that a huge amount of work in the field, you know, goes into cases where the final state is an equilibrium state, right? Which is to say, if I take some reasonably defined subset of the system, the reduced density matrix on it ends up looking like something like e to the minus beta h restricted to that region. So this is, you know, these are ergodic Hamiltonians, and then 
If you know that this is true at long times, that the system approaches equilibrium, then there's this enormous machinery of quantum statistical mechanics and quantum field theory, which is brought to bear in thinking about the properties. So what you do is you compute with, with, with this beast, that in time looks like a path interval, and then you can do all sorts of marvelous and wonderful things with it. Now, in terms of probing it, uh, you generally probe, you know, but in linear response theory, which you should think of as a, you know, weak interaction or a weak right, with the system. I don't use the term weak measurement, which has a which has a precise meaning. But so that's in, in cartoon. That's the most common thing that we are going to do uh, that we have done traditionally in looking at quantum systems. Now, from the viewpoint of what a quantum computer can do, you know, this is sort of limited. There are all sorts of stuff I could have done in the middle, which I didn't do. Uh, I could have measured things. I could have fed the information back in the system. And then the particular unitary itself is very special. It's generated by a uh, permission operator, the Hamiltonian. Um, so when you combine the two, uh, it seems fairly clear that the set of things that we've looked at is, um, is potentially a small fraction of the set of things that could exist, the full set of evolutions in this uh, device with the combination of you know, unitaries and measurements. Um, of course, it's been uh, good to do what we've done, partly because systems equilibrate um, and you look around and you know that uh, is a wonderful set of things to study. Uh, and second, of course, as I mentioned, that the theoretical tools available to deal with equilibrium calculations uh, are superb. And um, so, of course, I'm ambitious to use them. Okay. Now, I'm absolutely exaggerating, which is to say, of course, non-equilibrium phenomena have been of long of interest to physicists. Um, the Boltzmann equation was written down to try and understand how an equilibrium state would indeed be reached. There's also the extensions of the Boltzmann equation to quantum systems, uh, which you can, you know, which are more complicated. Even the Boltzmann equation itself, you know, has uh, issues regarding its fundamental validity. Uh, but nevertheless, those are, you know, in, in practice, interesting and, and useful and productive ways of thinking about how systems approach equilibrium. There's the topic of hydrodynamics. So what, you know, which is sort of near equilibrium physics. And much more importantly, in, uh, in, in recent, I would say in, in at least the last decade but more, the advent of um, cold atoms, which are really you know, uh, a close you know, system to these uh, systems which make up the NIST devices that we are now starting to look at, has certainly inspired a, an entire field of non-equilibrium quantum dynamics. In which people have looked at all sorts of things, often with you know some combination of tools such as analytic models like random circuits, as well as a huge amount of computational work, which has become possible due to advances in classical computation. But nevertheless, um, if you walked into an experimental lab, the, the typical experiment would indeed still involve you know lowering the temperature, waiting for the system to settle, measuring something. Okay. Now I mentioned cold atoms just to say that. Um, you know, there's a tendency to say, well, X came by and nothing like this has been ever seen before. But in fact, cold atoms are a wonderful system um, and already allow all sorts of, you know, uh, heroics in terms of what you can do and, and so on. They themselves are successors to a, a whole tradition of generating artificial and uh, physical systems, going back to two-dimensional electron gases, forwards to twisted binary graphene. So, Maybe a, a more accurate view of what's going on is that there is a something which is QID-ness in terms of what you can do. And this is time. And you know, there's some curve like that. And I would say we are here in 2021, which is absolutely things have been happening. But I think there's reason to think that the new generation devices will really accelerate the process. So by the time we look back from here to where we were back then, I think we will say a few that we found it. But of course, you know, you're absolutely entitled to complain that um, you know, we're, we're not there. Um, Shivaji, there's a there's a question on the QA which might help sharpen this a little bit. So so I, I think the question is just asking for clarification. Does the interactive aspect here refer to the use of measurement-based feedback to steer the dynamics in real time? 
And so is that uh, axis, is that the y-axis? Uh, okay, so that's uh, th that's certainly one part of it, and that's uh, the, the part that I understand best. But the the term itself is borrowed from you know uh, our friends in computer science, such as Amish, and I think um, you know th they've shown that that you know using sort of CS ideas that you can um, you know, actually constrain the behavior. Uh, so th that, that that's a slightly different idea, although I guess at the end of the day, you know, there's still this notion that you ask certain questions and, and then you do certain things. Uh, so, so I would say that it's some mix of things I understand and things I don't understand, which is, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, the, the CS aspects of, you know, thinking of interactivity in, in a more precise sense. So while we added, there was another question which just asked, what does QID stand for? So. Just, uh, uh, quantum interactive dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, borrowing shamelessly from QED and QCD. That's it. Proceed. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Actually, Mish, please, please interrupt. And, uh, with that. I, it's slightly below my screen, so I can't necessarily see that that well when the questions pop up. All right, good. Um, excellent. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is to say that this new toolkit, right, this capacity to be in uh, much more intimate contact with the system, uh, it's already allowing new phenomena to be demonstrated in the lab, which would be sort of impossible in, in more traditional, you know, many body systems. And as an example, I'll discuss the phenomenon of eigenstate order. Uh, in the MBL time crystal, which was seen in this Google quantum processor. So I'll, I'll give you a high level view of what uh, you know, that was about. Um, and um, I, I, I won't get that much into the time crystal aspect. That's actually not so interesting for the context of our discussion today. Uh, but what is actually interesting is, is the idea of eigenstate order and, and why you need such a device uh, to be able to, you know, to see this phenomenon and, and what tricks which are in the, in the air uh, uh, were very useful in, in, our, in our seeing it. So I now want to discuss this phenomenon of eigenstate order in an MDL time crystal. Um, okay, and so observation. A quantum processor. All right. So um, let me get to that. So what is the uh, you know okay. So so first of all. This is a phenomenon in a flow K system, right? So in Kanas matter jargon, it means that there is a, the, the, the system has a time dependent Hamiltonian, which is periodic. And therefore, if you want to know uh, what is the uh, unitary, if you go N periods, That that's equal to some single period unitary raised to the power. Yeah. Okay. So it's not the most general unitary you can have. On the other hand, uh, it's it, neither is it right. It is not e to the minus i h t. So it, it's not a time independent Hamiltonian. It is a driven system. So as such, it's already uh, out of equilibrium. Uh, the only kind of equilibrium it could have from the principles of statistical mechanics would be that the system heats up to infinite temperature and then everything is totally featureless. Um, just because once you no longer have a conserved energy, uh, then you know, the statistical mechanics tells you that you can't have something like e to the minus beta h because that came from saying that you had a, an energy that was conserved. All right, so um, good. Now, the particular unitary, which gives us this phase, 
uh, is something which acts on a set of uh, qubits arising spins. And what that looks like is that you act in, um, so, let me, let me just write out the ingredients, which is to say you act for some part of the period with something that looks like gi, zi, zi plus one. So in physics jargon, it's an Ising interaction. And then in the second part, you act with something that looks like um, a transverse field. So on a single site. Okay, so notice that I put down, so this system physics wise is organized one dimensionally. So it really does look like the, the picture of qubits arranged in a row. I have nearest neighbor interactions and things that are on, on, on site. So, 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 so this happens over cert, a certain period, and then this happens over uh, you know, a certain period, which are built into the values of J and, and gap. Now, you need some amount of randomness in these couplings. So Ji is going to be some average value plus some fluctuations, and gamma i is going to be some average value plus some fluctuations. Now, what you get when you analyze this problem uh, is a phase diagram uh, as a function of these average values. Um, and of course, I'm being you know, somewhat sloppy in the sense that you do have to fret about the fluctuations, which has this sort of uh, structure where if you don't have a transverse field and all you have is a, an exchange interaction, then it's a problem if I just go back here. If all I'm doing is acting with this piece, well, of course, that is the case of a time independent Hamiltonian, which is you know, sitting up there multiplied by some time. If I'm only acting with the second piece, then again, it's a time independent Hamiltonian. It's when I switch between these two that my Hamiltonian now has time dependence. In this case, a very simple one, it's a sort of binary dependence. It's you know, one or the other, but that's enough to take us out of the class of Hamiltonian, time-independent Hamiltonian systems into Floquet systems. So this axis has just an Ising exchange and therefore you expect it to uh, have long range order in, in spins. Uh, I'll call this phase a spin glass for a reason I'll explain shortly. And then this, if I only have uh, you know, this axis, then I have uh, what we call the Ising paramagnet. So these are traditional phases studied in time independent systems, except that when you add a little bit of the other thing, they sort of continue, even though now the Hamiltonian is, is somewhat time dependent. And then here is this phase, which has become famous as the discrete time crystal. Although initially we had called it the pi spin glass, and you'll see in a minute why, because it has a uh, close intimate connection to this spin glass. And finally, this is something which we call the zero pi paramagnet, which I won't uh, you know, discuss today. Now, the randomness I mentioned is extraordinarily important to be able to actually draw this phase diagram. If all I had were uniform couplings, then this axis would be fine and that axis would be fine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, and the, the, the boundaries would be fine, but once you moved a little bit away from the boundary, in the absence of randomness, actually, you would heat up to infinite temperature and there would be nothing interesting to observe. So, so physics-wise, it's very important that there be this randomness. There has to be sufficient randomness to cause this phenomenon of many-body localization, which for practical purposes means you don't equilibrate. And more intuitively, it means that you sort of get stuck in, uh, you know, in, in Hilbert space. You don't, you don't move around as much. Okay, so um, good. Now, what is, how do I tell that I've got, you know, sort of this phase? So, so th 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 there's an answer that I can give, uh, you know, as a as a theorist, and then there's the question of, uh, you know, what answer is actually useful if I'm going to go to 
uh, you know, an experiment. Okay. So the answer as a theorist uh, is that this phase, for example, like any unitary has eigenvalues that live on a circle. And so if I look in this DTC phase, uh, what I find is that the eigenvalues of the unitary in the limit of a large system come in pairs which live diametrically opposite, right? So they form a pi pair. One sits here and the other sits here. There's one sits here and one sits there. So- uh, Shivaji, the, the, yeah. there's an important, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, it says, is the only difference between this Floquet evolution and trotterized evolution of the transverse field Ising model that you aren't constrained to having to evolve under a small time step, which is of course very important. Yeah. Uh, is the only difference? That, that you aren't constrained to evolve, having to evolve under a small time step. Uh, I guess that's, I guess that's right. Yeah, I mean, the point is that if you, you these phases, if you put the limits on your phase boundary at pi over two, right, the, the novel phases exist when your J and your, right. and, and your H are, are comparable to the frequency, right? That, that was the challenge, so then, uh, right. In no, the limit, yeah. Right, right. You know, so the question, I, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it that way, that if, if the trotter error, you know, if the trotter interval is, is, is not infinitesimal, which it is in the, in the theorist sense when you do it, I guess eventually you're, you're doing floquet, um, which I hadn't thought about, but I guess that's true. Yeah, I mean, the strict trotterization is the limit where that time interval goes to zero. And, and this is absolutely when things are finite. Sorry, Shivaji, can I, can I ask these, these two axes, they are the yeah. frequency with which you, with, with which you apply the two uh, different Hamiltonians? Uh, okay, so, so, I, so you can think of the first one as imagine that you, during this interval capital T, Mm -hmm. Maybe you go from zero to, you know, you, you have some t t tau one and uh, let's call it T one and T two, right? Such that T one plus T two is equal to capital T. So, so this number maybe, you know, if I think of them as exchange constants, I can then replace it by, uh, you know, the fact that it's, this is the Hamiltonian and I'm multiplying it by T one. This is the Hamiltonian and I'm multiplying by T two. So it's really a composite of these two that decides uh, you know, what is it that you're doing? Mm -hmm. And you're alternating back and forth for T by T. Alternating back and forth. Right? That's right. First one, then the other, then one, then the other. That's right. Okay, good. Um, right. Okay. So, to, to understand that this is special, let's walk across to this side and, and look on this axis. So on this axis, all we had was this, you know, sum over i, ji, zi, zi plus one times, let me now write it as, as I just said, times t1. Okay. So this is a unitary, but if you're interested in understanding its spectrum, you really just need to think about the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And that we know has the feature that, because this one has an Ising symmetry, right? I could send, the eigenvalue of zi to minus zi uh, and on all sides, and I would get exactly the same energy. So if I think of the, the, the spin glass, which I'm calling the spin glass, that has a whole bunch of states where there are two states right, right on top of each other. So the first one is there and the second one is there. The first one is there and the second one is there. Whereas in the pi spin glass, the first one is here and the second one is there. The first one is here and the second one is there. Okay. So, in both cases, there is a doublet that emerges in the spectrum, but in the Floquet phase, the doublet is actually split by pi. I can, I mean, it, 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 would, it wouldn't take very long to, for you to see in the simplest case that that's true. All you need to do is to think about this axis. And what you will discover there is that the unitary ends up looking like the following, which is it's got this ji, zi, zi plus one, but the, in the limit that the disorder in gamma is extremely narrow, this value pi over two is chosen so that the net result of the transverse field is to flip the spins exactly in the z basis. So this is the Ising flip operator. 
And so then it's easy to convince yourself that if you had an eigenstate of this, then what it does is it flips it to the Ising pair. And so the eigenvalues end up being Schrodinger cats, which is any particular spin configuration plus or minus its Ising reverse counterpart. And these are the states that end up having eigenvalues. So in one case, there's a Schrodinger cat, you know, so you get plus minus one uh, times some eigenvalue, which I'm now writing classically. These are operators. And, and this plus minus one is exactly this pi shift across the, um, across the circle. So um, actually maybe I should say two things at the same time. So with this, the, the eigenstates are, uh, you know, Z1 through Zn plus or minus Z1 bar through Zn bar, where think of the bar as, as being something which is reflected. And this unitary acting on them gives me plus or minus Z plus or minus Z bar. So the reason we call this phase the spin glass is because every eigenstate of the spectrum. Now on, on the left boundary, the eigenstate is are basically just either Z's or, or Z bars, right? Uh, only one or the other, but each one of them has long range order in the Z basis, which is if you calculate ZI, ZJ, the correlation function, you know, that does not go to zero as I minus J goes to infinity, which is the physicist's definition of long range order. Um, so that's true along this axis. And it's also true along this axis because the Schrodinger cats have the same feature. But nevertheless, the two phases are not the same. And that's because the eigenvalues of the unitary have a different um, structure and, and a different doublet structure. OK, so, so that's the, the theorist view of the, uh, of the time crystal, that it's a, a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a floquet phase where the, you know, unitaries have this feature in the spectrum. And the eigenstates of the unitaries have long range order in the canonical sense of um, uh, you know, quantum statistical mechanics. So the, the, the upshot of that is that if you imagine that you have a, uh, sorry, sorry, I don't know that yet. Uh, so let's add. Um. So sorry, uh, Shivaji, very very quickly. Um, so can can you can you say in in a sentence the the distinction between the spin glass and the and the time crystal was exactly what? So you you have sure. So let me write it in the next one. So in the spin glass, uh, so formally I can define a single period unitary, although there's really a Hamiltonian, and the eigenstates are z one through z n. Right, and this is degenerate with um, z1 bar through zn bar, where each bar indicates an Ising reversal, and they have the same eigenvalue. Okay, okay. so in other words, both of them, uh, u on this or that, gives me some e to the i lambda at times you know the state itself. Okay. Um, Whereas in the in the time crystal, u on z1, so let me just call it z plus or minus z bar. So the eigenstates are now the Schrodinger cats, put a square root of two if I want to be, um, are, you know, it gives me e to the i lambda plus or minus one times z plus or minus z bar. So that's that. That's the difference. Identical eigenvalues, and then the fact that the eigenstates are necessarily yes. have this macroscopic superposition. Okay. And then, as I move back in the phase diagram uh, into the interior of the phase diagram, right, the picture gets more complicated. But there is <coughs> a set of variables um, in, in terms of which this continues to be true. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the, in an experiment, you're not going to go measure uh, you know, the eigenvectors of the, of the unitary anymore than you measure eigenvectors of Hamiltonians in many body systems. 
So in order to um, measure things in an experiment, uh, you have to realize that what happens as you evolve a given initial state uh, is that something uh, very simple happens. So again, in the picture that I'm describing for these idealized limits, what happens is if you think of this unitary, right? And you think of it as acting on some particular state on the Z basis, this one just picks up a phase and this one flips it. So in the idealized limit, you see that what's gonna happen is you've got some state you know, up, down, up, up, down. And at the next time step, this is going to become down. This is going to become, right? They'll just flip. And at the next time step, you'll go back to what you used to be. So this is step zero, period one, period two, and so on and so forth. So in this idealized case, you see, and this, that the a starting initial state actually repeats uh, after period two. And so the reason this thing came to be called the time crystal is that the unitary itself repeats after period one, but the state repeats after two periods, which is you know, the sort of standard way in which you get a broken symmetry. You have a symmetry of the dynamics, but the, but the state does not respect. Okay. Now, again, as you move away from these idealized you know, limits in which you can write these very simple pictures, it's not obvious that all of this works, uh, but it does. And so what will happen is that if you feed it something like this, it will get modified. You're not going to get you know, perfect, but nevertheless, at long times, there is a remnant magnetization, which at sufficiently long times will repeat this pattern uh, with, with the period two. So you've got to wait a while, you've got to evolve it, but eventually uh, you know, that will do it. So that tells you, uh, you know, how to go about uh, looking experimentally for this phenomenon, uh, which is to say, you give this, you know, you, so you, you give your quantum processor a multiple initial strings produced in the, uh, you know, computational or Z basis. You act on it with the Floca unitary implemented on the quantum processor some number of times. And then you do a measurement, and then you want to check that for, uh, you know, every single configuration that you could feed it, it's going to show this phenomenon uh, at long times. Okay. So now at this point, I, I've actually slipped in the idea of eigenstate order. Right? So traditionally in the sort of, in many body physics, um, you, you look, if you're looking for interesting quantum phenomena, you look near the ground state um, and, um, and you know, a quantum phase transition, for instance, involves something that you know is just a ground state. Um, so it's it's really a relatively small part of the spectrum that you focus on. Then you have finite temperature phase transitions, where generally, in the traditional understanding, the phenomenon ultimately ends up being, you know, fairly classical in terms of some variables. Uh, and then, even in that case, uh, if you go to high enough temperatures, the phenomenon disappears. Like your typical ordering transition in a condensed matter system, superconductivity magnetism, is a phenomenon up to some finite temperature. But of course, if you're thinking from the viewpoint of the Hilbert space, most of the states in the Hilbert space are actually you know, near infinite temperature. So your typical ordering phenomenon in an equilibrium system uh, takes place for a vanishing fraction of the states you know, it's some, some suitable set of states uh, in, in Hilbert space. Here, the, the, the statement is being made is that every single eigenstate of the unitary exhibits this ordering, which is much stronger than anything you would have uh, tried to discuss previously. And a central part of this is many body localization, which means that you don't equilibrate. It also means that you're able to stabilize ordering in states that you would normally think of as having high energy. Um, so there's also a Hamiltonian version of what I'm describing, in which case you can literally talk about the energy. Uh, so again, this phenomenon of eigenstate order is really new. It's a real departure in quantum statistical mechanics um, because it's something which is not captured by an equilibrium ensemble. Indeed, if you use the corresponding naive equilibrium ensemble, you wouldn't see this phenomenon at all, but you learn it if you examine the eigenstates individually, and then you can detect it in this dynamical fashion 
by starting with the whole ensemble of states, evolving them and seeing what happens at late times. Okay? So in the spirit of our discussion today, I want to emphasize that you know, preparing a whole slew of such states in your traditional solid state system is simply not possible. You, know, you typically equilibrate some temperature and you vary that to try and get states uh, you know, near low temperatures and up to certain temperature. You really couldn't look at these states, which would be infinite temperature by some, some metric and you wouldn't be able to get to them. So you really need these new devices where you can do the target uh, the initial you know, a strain of this kind that you are trying to prepare. So far so good? Okay. So, um, so what was needed to be done? I'm a bit concerned that I can't see a clock. I'm sure. I'm, uh, it's eleven fifty, Shivani. Okay. So I should I should stop in ten minutes, right? Um, so okay. So what was done in the in the experiment with the Google team uh, was to use their um, you know device. And um, maybe I'll just point to some pictures in paper. Okay, so as you can see, there's the statement of what happens when you have, uh, you know, sort of a perfect alignment and when you don't, which is on the other side. So, Okay, so basically using their native, you know, gate set, uh, we were able to um, sit on this phase diagram that I, I discussed. Something actually I neglected to say, which is, which is uh, also important, it's a somewhat different idea, is that I talked about the initial model in terms of a model which has Ising symmetry, it had very special couplings, a ZZ and an X. Actually, one of the remarkable aspects of this phase is that it's absolutely stable meaning that once you found it, you can add any weak time dependent perturbation of the Hamiltonian. It doesn't have to have any particular symmetry and yet the phenomenon survives. So that's very useful also from an experimental viewpoint, uh, but it's also important to check you know, that that's true. So in fact, uh, in, the, you know, in the experiments um, that happens naturally and that made it also a very useful phenomenon to look for uh, because you were not trying to find you symmetry in order to find. So you've got initial random bit strings which you feed into a flow case system, um, you know, flow case circuit. And then as you vary parameters, you know, you're looking for uh, differences like what you see here that in, you know, uh, either you're gonna see oscillate, well, let's look, look down here, you know, either, in a thermal phase, you're going to lose the initial magnetization that you had imprinted, or in a, in a discrete time crystal, you're going to see it go on uh, you know, for a very long time. Now, um, one thing to, to mention is, of course, when you do the experiment straightforwardly, right, what you see is stuff that decays. Right? Now, it could be decaying for two reasons. It could be decaying because it's an experimental limitation, which of course exists. These are imperfect devices. It's not perfect military evolution. So you're gonna get dephasing from the environment or it could be decaying because the qubit in question sees the rest of the system as a dephasing environment, which is sort of intrinsic dephasing, but that's physical. That's because you know in a thermalizing system, that's what's gonna happen. So one of the things you want to try and tell is whether the decay that you're seeing is coming from extrinsic sources or intrinsic sources. And one of the powerful features of this device is that there's a natural way to do that. And which is basically, uh, you know, shown sort of sketched here that you can run this unitary forwards and then backwards, right? And if it's intrinsic dephasing, a result of unitary evolution, then of course you'll undo it. But if it's extrinsic dephasing, you won't, you, you know, you, you'll double it. So you're able to use that to extract the, the, the part of the decay uh, that you think is coming from extrinsic sources, imperfections. And then you can take ratios of the signal that you see to what you estimate as the uh, extrinsic dephasing. And that then gives you uh, signals that are much more sharply distinct between the thermal phase and the discrete time crystal. So again, 
it's the, the fact that you can do these tricks on these devices, right, is, uh, is, is very, very important um, to, to being able to see this physics. Now, I mentioned that you want to check what happens for all initial strings. Now, of course, as the system gets bigger, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to you know, initialize. So I think we did it for 500, uh, but, you know, for 20, we didn't do it for two to the 20. But then there's another trick you can use, which is again, very specific to these devices, namely that you can use the you know, random circuits that were used in the uh, quantum supremacy experiment to start with some string and then act with this random circuit and get a state here, which is actually um, you know, sort of close to a high random state I mean, for practical purposes. And once you have a, a high random state, uh, what, the, what you call quantum typicality tells you that that state, while it's a single state, but it's a, it, it has the properties of an infinite temperature ensemble. Okay. So you can prepare a single state by using first unitaries mimicking a random circuit, then feed that into the Floquet evolution. And in that fashion, you can average over all the initial strings you know, at one go. You don't sit there and make, make each one. So that's another very powerful trick, which is possible by using what we know about these devices and the manner in which we can use them, which again means that you have a way of averaging over the entire spectrum, which is scalable. You, know, you can just make bigger devices and use the same trick and be able to do it. So you're not stymied by the fact that you would have to prepare infinitely many uh, you know, starting states. Um, so, so both of these are important. And as a result of that, we were able to convince ourselves that we had uh, a capacity to see the phenomenon and not see the phenomenon, to be able to tell the difference between intrinsic dephasing and extrinsic dephasing, and to convince ourselves that it was an eigenstate order phenomenon, which is to say it was present throughout the spectrum. There have been previous experiments on, you know, uh, claiming to see time crystals, but they have seen what in the jargon would be called a pre-thermal time crystal, which for our purposes means that only a vanishing fraction of the initial strings actually had the capacity to produce oscillations uh, at long times, and that the typical one actually did not. Uh, so this was you know, very important uh, for us to be able to, to do this. Um, okay, so I guess I've got three minutes left. So maybe um, I should um, uh, say a few things uh, back here. So, you know, so, so, so what happens next? Um, no, so what next? Okay, so the first thing I should mention um, is that there's actually a beautiful body of work in which I have not been involved um, myself except very little at the start, um, which is on measurement induced phase transitions. So in the work that I described to you, we didn't use, really use the full toolkit of you know, being able to uh, interleave unitary evolution and measurement. So we certainly used some of the bag of tricks, which is available on these quantum devices, capacity to initialize, capacity to you know, create superpositions um, of you know, states which are roughly high random. But this theoretical work of measurement-induced phase transitions actually interleaves unitary evolution and measurements in a fundamental way. And basically what happens in, in, in this work is you've got a set, you, you act with you know, various unitary gates, um, and then you also interleave them with measurements. And the question was, you know, if you measure at a certain rate, you know, do you, uh, you know, do you destroy quantumness and, and, and drive the system classical? For example, if you ask about the entanglement, if you didn't have the measurement, the entanglement would be going towards a, a volume law. But if you have measurements, you know, would it, um, would any measurements, uh, you know, basically disentangle the system? So the, the answer turned out to be no, that there are actually interesting phase transitions that separate the regimes where you get a volume law entanglement and you don't. Um, the, 
there's a lot of beautiful detail that has come out the connections to even uh, long-standing problems in, in statistical mechanics and quantum field theory connections to CFT. And presumably it's only a matter of time that uh, something like this will be demonstrated in one of these devices. And that will take, you, take us, uh, I think, deeper into this QID territory uh, because it's a phenomenon that you know, genuinely could not have existed in the absence of being able to measure and, and, and do unitary evolution. The next step would be then sort of feedback in which you do measurements and you, and you do something else on top of it as opposed to simply measuring it and continuing on with the plan that you have to begin with. So I think that's roughly what I wanted to say. And I think I've come to a stop at an hour. Um, so um, I'll stop. Uh, thank you. Uh... That's exactly on exactly at noon. So, um, thanks a lot, uh, Shivaji. That was uh, that was excellent. So, um, are there any um, are there any further questions um, uh, before we move on to the panel? Um, so, at this point, if, if if there's a question, you can just speak up. Uh, um, uh, otherwise. Um, um, maybe if we can if we can start pinning the the videos of the of the panelists. Um, uh, so Shivaji, if you if you would stop the sharing, then maybe they can. Yeah.